So the second part of my lecture on uh, Miriam Gerba uh, begins with uh, the great work of Sonia, uh, Sonia Lopez uh, Chavez, whose work I collect. Uh, I just love, love this, this mermaid, this tattooed, tough chola uh, mermaid. It makes me think of uh, another one of my favorite tough, you know, writers. And that's the one and only Miriam Gerba. I love this glamour shot of hers. It's just amazing. Um, so in the second part of the lecture, I'm going to be focused on Dahlia season, which is the uh, main work, uh, the longer work, novella, inside. Uh, novella, I don't mean telenovela, okay? A novella is a genre, a subgenre of literature. It's, there's the novel right? Uh, which is a, a medium, but there's also the novella, which is a short, uh, a short novel. So um, it's a technical term, literary term, but you know, I'm a lit prof. Can I, I can't, can't apologize enough for that. All right, so um, let's begin. Let's begin by turning to page 65, and you can read along with me. The opening is just classic Gerba. Florecita Negra. I love her little footnote translations. Little black flower. Black. You want to think about black with Dahlia season, right? Because there's a lot of darkness. A lot of the things go down in the dark. A lot of the subject matter is dark. Uh, Desiree Garcia's fantasies in Dahlia season are dark, 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 dark. And so... Um, so sorry about that. Uh, I had a knock at the door, undergraduates from San Diego State uh, coming to harass me with questions about papers and you know, you know the drill. All right. So I was about to uh, begin reading from page 65 uh, in, in Dahlia season. I noticed in that last clip I was saying um a lot and I will try not to say um. Um, um, see, did it again. You can't stop it. All right. Florecita Negra. I used to pride myself on being a freak magnet. Yes, los weirdos de este mundo, the weirdos of this world, had a sweet tooth for me. Walking home from school, flashers would show me their nuts. Later on, during cartoons, I'd get up to go answer the knocks at the front door, only to find a wet-behind-the-ears Mormon missionary wiping his feet on our doormat. It was the 80s, and Nancy Reagan had taught me well. I knew to just say no because the kid was ready to get me hooked on drugs. I think my freak magnet Hall of Fame moment had to have been the time that this fugitive who'd busted out a holding from the municipal courthouse picked my window to climb through. I was kneeling on my bedroom carpet, sniffing my strawberry shortcake doll's hair. Its candy smell was like kitty crack. And the male prisoner crouched just a few feet away from me, looking really feline. He expertly lifted a long, thin finger to his mouth. Maybe he was a thief or a pickpocket or something. Shh, he breathed. Desiree, the police chief uh, out on our driveway screamed through a megaphone. He read from a prepared script designed to call me. Don't be scared. He's only a plumber. He's only a plumber. Ha! I was only in second grade, but not in the remedial class. Plumbers didn't wear orange jumpsuits with numbers stencil on them. Not busted shackles on their wrists, either. I looked the guy in the eye. I lifted my doll back up to my nose real deliberately and sniffed. The convict went, grinned wide. We were cool. He winked, rubbed his palms together, and dove beneath my canopy bed as a massive dragnet finished closing in and around our house. Since that moment... My pull's been tried and true. I'm a gifted, I am gifted with a strong flies to shit thing. Like does attract like, and the loonies have a sixth sense that we're on of the same ilk and all. To put it even more bluntly, if I were a scratch and sniff sticker, I'd smell like bananas, because that's what I am. Totally bananas. Desiree Garcia is great. She's, she's a loca. She's crazy. It's funny. I really relate to uh, Desiree uh, and to Miriam. Um, 
I used to say I must be short a chromosome or something, or you know, I must have some sort of anomaly that schizophrenics have. Because anytime I'm walking on a big city street, if there's a homeless person, if there's some deranged, you know, loco, loca, I, I know that's not the politically correct term, um, a mentally disturbed person on the streets, uh, they come to me. They, they come up, they shake my hand, they want to give me hugs. It's like, oh, you're home. Like I'm familia or something. So reading Dahlia Susan, uh, it really appeals to me because uh, I, I know what it's like to be a, a magnet for uh, alternative consciousness uh, people. Okay, all right. So let's move on. Desiree's uh, life in, from the United States to Mexico and back is a whirlwind. Um, I love following Gerba's uh, uh, construction. Of this character. She's a, uh, I mean, this could really be young adult fiction if it wasn't so obscene. Um, you know, Harry Potter for, for the goths, uh, for the lesbian goth scene, uh, because it really does what uh, YA young adult novels do, and, and, and that's what in literary terms is classically called the Bildungsroman, B-I-L-D-U-N-G, R O M A N. Yes, it will be on the final. It will be on the te on the test. And the Bildungsroman is a novel that follows a young person uh, as they grow up through crisis, not necessarily to maturity, but through the consequences of crisis. And Desiree Garcia, in uh, Dahlia season, the novella, classic classic Bildungsroman. Um, if you want to look up a V. Uh, avatar, no, the exemplar for uh, classic Bildungsroman, look up a book called uh, The Sorrows of Young uh, it's Werther W-E-R-T-H-E-R -E -E and it's written by a guy who when I was a little Chicano Tejano in Laredo, I thought his name was Gothi <laughs> G-O-E-T-H-E -E. his name's Goethe and he wrote a great German writer German Romanticism doesn't exist without Goethe. And uh, he wrote a novel, Sorrows of Young uh, Veta, and which is difficult because his name is Goethe, but it looks like Gothi. Anyway, Bildungsroman, Dahlia season, definitely a 21st century of Bildungs, Bildungsroman. Um, she's got this real power for uh, of description uh, it's very sensual uh, I love this scene when they go to the cathedral uh, it's on the bottom of page 73 all right and it is really important in these videos when I say to go to a page go to that page have it in front of you and then listen to the words uh, of course as I read them but look at them on the page there's something about that coming together of reading and listening that sparks the imagination and uh, it's why in our lit classes we spend so much time reading from the work and people think yeah he's just trying to kill time no it's because we we, we actually discover a uh, new meaning from this confluence of input from hearing and seeing the words at once okay so bottom of page 73 we stroll two blocks down cobblestone paths to the Metropolitan Cathedral, ignoring all the vendors selling cheapy trinkets out front. Up the steps, through the doorway, and into the cavernous sanctuary, I planted my feet on the white marble floor. Below it was dusty catacombs, full of dead priests. I wanted to rush down to them to see their coffins, but then a flock of pilgrims caught my attention. Shoot! I couldn't believe I'd forgotten about Innocencia. And, and this, is, this is really interesting, because you've got a character called Dese Desire, Desiree, who's thinking about a dead saint named Innocencia. And you really want to think about the names in Dahlia season. Um, Desiree, its relationship to desire uh, and control which she lacks totally, especially with her imagination. And um, in this case, Innocencia, right? The, the idea that someone would be named for this virtue. 
innocence, you know, like Saint Innocence. Shoot, I couldn't believe I, I'd forgotten about Innocencia. Santa Innocencia, Saint Innocence, the little Roman girl martyr whose own dad had set her up to be killed for having turned Christian. He'd buried her, but in spite of having spent centuries underground, her body took its sweet time rotting. In Italy, zealots unearthed her pretty corpse and had it shipped to monks in Spain, and somehow La Santinta had most recently come to rest on a silk bed only a few yards away. Mom had brought me here to see her before, and now I was ready to become one of the looky loos wanting to ogle and cluster around her glass coffin. Leaving Thea's side, I approached the west wall where she slept. Ascending two small steps, I got as close as I could to the saint and then realized my nose was pressed up to the glass. My hot breath fogged up the pain. I watched the dead girl sleep, flaking like snow, snow white, blanca, blanca nieves. Innocencia's skull had been sculpted over with wax and painted over to make her look like she was still made out of flesh, and I remembered the gallery of stars, David Hasselhoff, Charlie Chaplin, Elton John, that I'd seen at the Hollywood Wax Museum one Christmas vacation. She might have been falling apart, but, but she might have been kind of falling apart, but Innocencia was better than them. Her long white dress and crown of flake fl fake flowers made it seem like she was going to wake up any second and go stand in line for her first communion. I glanced at her gloved hands, mesh. Through it, fingers, gray ones, or really just phalanges, fleshless phalanges. I could see them through the holes in a most advanced stage of human decomposition. I held my breath. Finally, I let it out. It's beautiful. This is like classic, classic Chicano literature, right? Because we've got the saints and the catolicos, you know, la virgen, la inocencia, la santa, the stuff we'd associate with traditional old school Catholic uh, beliefs and imagery, um, the world of my mother, uh, the world of my grandmother, you know, en la iglesia with the relics of the santos. But here... We have a next generation, post-movimiento era, young Chicana, Desiree. And what she's thinking of is not, ay, Diosito mío, nombre del padre, you know, inocencia. No, she's thinking about David Hasselhoff, you know, from Baywatch. She's thinking about the Hollywood um, the Waxworks, the Wax Museum. And what she does in that one instant is she shows the range of Latino-Latina culture. We are very much still attached to the past, but we're also very much people of the present, people of tomorrow. And as we grow, as our, as our cultural influence grows, uh, we're going to see this exploding. It's going to be exploding all, all over the place. Before we end, let's look at a, a couple more passages, okay? <clears throat> I really like the way that uh, Gerba handles um, scenes that could be like over the top or controversial, but her characters seem to take everything in stride. Like when, when she's she, she's found in this chapter, which I think is called Incest, a House of Incest, because she has these extraordinarily intimate uh, relationships with familia, right, with cousins uh, and the like. And uh, on page 81, we read, uh, she's, she's with Lourdes, um, and they're making out. Um, I had Lourdes down on my bed and was giving her a monster hickey, and this shocked Desiree jolted us out of our ecstasy. Lourdes's racing heartbeat vibrated my taste buds. I unsuctioned my mouth from her flat chest and glanced over my shoulder. Mom stood in the doorway. Oh, my God. Her face was pale, her eyes absorbing the spectacle of my bathing suit dangling around my waist, Lourdes's chest glistening at her, all my wet spit winking as my cousin panted. Blood flooded all the capillaries in Mom's face, and she turned candy apple red, and the meanest blue vein bulged at her temple. 
Good girls, good little girls, don't touch each other this way, she seethed. Get dressed, come outside, and don't ever do that again. Embarrassed, we nodded and pulled away from each other and cleaned each other's spit off. We pulled our suits back on, and with leaden, though barefoot steps, we trudged out onto the hallway. Lesbian boot camp was kaput for the time being. Uh, very, very nice touch. Um, excellent control of uh, you know, her prose skill set. This is a, a Gerba, a very accomplished writer. Very, uh, it's like a Swiss watch. It's very light. What's going on is very heady stuff, and yet the, the, the narrative approach to it, very, very controlled, not subdued, but measured, measured. This is a, a calculating, uh, complex writer at the top of her game. All right, one more quote, and then, man. Um, one of the key themes in Dahlia season are uh, freaks. And I, if I have the time later, I'm going to put post some photos of this uh, photographer, Deanne Arbus, who was fascinated with, let's just call it, alternative humans. Uh, humans who are different. And, you know, uh, in this book we've got gimps, we've got geeks, we've got dorks. Uh, and, and Miriam very much wants to tell the story of these alternative personalities that very often get, um, excuse me, they get scapegoated. They get ostracized. So Neo's one of these characters, and if we turn to page 40, um, excuse me, 92, 93, uh, this is an interesting uh, scene unfolds here. Um, bottom of 46. How old are you? I blurted out. 20. Five years older than me. Can I have a sip of your squirt? I grabbed my half-empty bottle and thrust it at him. I'm sorry. It's just I get very thirsty. Here, have the rest. Do you go to school? No. I go to school. What do you do? I work with my father in the workshop. Jewelry? Yes. Nito pulled a crumpled sheet and pencil stub out of his jeans pocket. I brought some paper so we can exchange addresses. Here, he handed it to me. Write yours and I'll write mine. We took turns scribbling, and Nito tore off the scrap with his info, holding it for me to take. I took it. I'll write you, he promised, at least once a week. Nito swooped in, pushing his tongue down my throat and pulling away fast panting. I love you, Desiree, he said. With the back of my hand, I wiped spit off my mouth. Uh-huh, uh, me too, I mumbled. Nito, Nito stood, his baboon face red and sheepish, and he limped out of the house. And I wrote in my notes here, I don't know if you can see this, a novel that Deanne Arbus uh, would love. I, I write all, all over my books. I'm always writing in them because if we if we don't take notes with our hands, and it doesn't work with the keyboard, if we aren't writing, if we aren't scribing, uh, it just doesn't make an impression on our minds, especially now when we have so much digital uh, material around us. Uh, I love Dahlia season. It really is a season of freaks. It's a it's a circus freak show, not of of deformed people, but of people who have an alternative composition, a different kind of psyche, somewhat torn, utterly twisted, and yet perfectly human, perfectly Chicano and Chicana. Thank you very much. Tune in next week uh, as we turn to the equally uh, talented and remarkably, at times, disturbing and beautiful um, meditations, graphic meditations of Gilbert Hernandez with human diastrophism. Ore, I'll see you soon. Bye.